I want to start off by um, uh, acknowledging that we're on the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, um, represented here by the tsleil the Musqueam, uh, and the Squamish First Nations. I want to pay my respects to elders past and present um, and get everyone to think a bit about like what unconscious bias might mean as we um, go together on our journey of reconciliation uh, um, over the years and years and years ahead um, to a place that's uh, more equal, more fair, and a more inclusive community. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. How many people here have some sort of like idea about unconscious bias as a concept and as a training mechanism to enhance and accelerate diversity and inclusion? I'm gonna go through a bit of just like some of the key concepts about, uh, about unconscious bias um, and share with you some just like activities, some stories, some like just quick kind of takeaways that you can bring back to your uh, work and life. Um, and then I wanna give a lot of time to think a bit about like once we kind of accept and think about the unconscious biases that we bring to our work and life every day, what are some strategies and tactics for mitigating those biases? So how does, how does this strike you as the kind of things that we um, want to achieve together today? It's kind of like understanding some core concepts. Um, I think there's a real importance about people walking out of here today with a personal connection to what this means to, to them. And you're not going to resonate right away with all the biases that I'm going to list. Um, uh, I'll talk a bit about our, our partner and the research they've done to identify hundreds of different biases that we bring to work in life every day. Um, but, uh, but making a personal connection to at least one is important. Uh, we'll talk a bit about like some strategies and tactics for mitigating bias. So how many people here have a brain? All right, so if we have a brain, um, we have a bias. And so what does that mean? Um, I'll talk about sort of two things. So one is that uh, over the last sort of thousands of years, uh, human, the humanity's culture, so this microphone, smartphones, how we talk, what we wear, um, where we get our information, the internet, cars, this is all parts of our culture, has evolved at exponential paces, okay? Our brains are still hardwired for the savanna, right? What I mean by that is our brains haven't really evolved at the pace that our culture has evolved, and this makes things pretty complex in today's world. So we still think in these like really fast ways of um, uh, using bias to identify times we could be in danger, using bias to define who's in our in-group and who's maybe in the out-group, right? And that could be by how people look, if they're strangers, um, the color of their skin, the, their size, um, how they talk, accents, no accents, different languages, that sort, of, that sort of thing, right? So these are all types of biases that reflect this sort of hardwiring of the human brain that's uh, more reflective of when we were hiding from saber-toothed tigers than we were sort of like shrinking away from someone in a hoodie outside a SkyTrain terminal, okay? But it's uh, an important thing to take away is our culture is evolving at a pace that our hardwiring of our brain is not keeping up to, okay? So that's one, that's one piece. Um, there's also this, uh, uh, these ideas of, of um, thinking fast and thinking slow. So something about our, our biases is that like, we, biases are kind of good. They help us make decisions based on experiences. So if you have a certain kind of experience, like if you stand really close to someone and don't smile and stare at them, you're gonna get a certain kind of reaction. And it's gonna happen over and over and over and over again until you meet that one person who also behaves that way and then you can have your moment. But sort of um, experience after experience and after experience with that data is gonna help you over time make a quicker decision to like not do that, right? To take a step back, to smile, to like nod and, and this is how we build these kind of social skills, how we make very quick decisions, right? Some more um, uh, complicated or complex kind of decision making like where are you gonna go on family vacation or what to do with a million dollar grant you just got from the government. These kinds of things would be uh, examples of how you might take a longer time to process this. Bias is still gonna creep its way in, I'll talk a bit about that, right? But how that, that those are examples of like some very quick decision making and how bias can be helpful. Like it's, it would be, humans wouldn't get a lot done if it took us hours and hours to process what route to take to work, right? Or um, how to, um, uh, we might get a lot done if we um, didn't have the patience to kind of go through more complex or complicated decisions um, uh, and take the time we needed to take, right? Okay, so I'm gonna pause here for a second and talk a bit about what Van City um, went through. So uh, Van City has, um, uh, we partnered with the Neuro Leadership Institute. Has anyone here heard of the Neuro Leadership Institute? So if you Google like David Rock and the Neuro Leadership Institute, you'll come up with a, a few pretty um, awesome articles just about like uh, unconscious bias, what it is, and how to, um, uh, uh, how to mitigate certain kinds of bias. And most importantly, like how to really look at diversity and inclusion as an accelerator for like a healthier workplace, a healthier community. Okay, so we partnered with this organization 
um, we uh, went through, have gone through so far, two what are called sprints, so, so 30 days of learning, where there's sort of three what are called brain-friendly uh, videos that go through some key concepts about what is, uh, what are unconscious, what is unconscious bias, um, how do they kind of define it and organize these hundreds and hundreds of kinds of, of uh, biases. Um, and then we have created discussion guides so people could talk about them. Van City made a very interesting choice. So typically, this organization, um, they focus on just managers or people leaders going through the training. We made the choice to have everybody go through the, the learning. Um, uh, there's, a, as you can imagine, quite a cost attached to that. Um, but you can see kind of like the, the outcome of this. Like, it's a hard thing to unlearn at this, at this time. Um, so that's, we did a pilot group in, in uh, August, September, and then the rest of the organization um, that were available to go through the training went through in um, November, December. Um, it's one of the most successful uh, training initiatives we've ever run in terms of completion. So about 94% of the organization has completed uh, this, this uh, training experience. Just on, it's just under, it's like 93.4, I should just be honest. Uh, so 93.4. Uh, percent of people have completed and we're going to be running another sprint in uh, May or June to have everyone who's like been hired since was away during that that experience to kind of go through this this learning right that's one part of it is this this, this sprint three videos a live webinar to discuss these concepts um, and now what we're working on uh, is thinking about how we're going to sustain this so how do we sustain this training through integration into some of our other learning and development programs day-to-day um, -day work and, and people decisions um, things like that I'll give some examples about what that looks like at the end Okay, great. How many people have seen this before? What, and what is it? It's the ladder of inference. So I was mentioning before about like how human beings make decisions. So we get, we see things, you've all seen me, you've made a, um, probably decisions about beards and ties and single or straight white able-bodied men of privilege. Um, and some of those uh, things are confirmable because um, I just disclosed that to you and some of them are not confirmable. Like you might wonder what's going on in my, in my head and in my brain and you're gonna learn more about um, uh, how to apply some of these concepts today in, in sort of like mental health and inclusion and uh, access programs and accommodation kind of decision making this afternoon. Um, so we have observational data. Um, based on our experiences and our biases, we're gonna select the kind of certain aspects of this, of this data. Um, we're going to add meaning to it, um, maybe through some feedback or through conversations that we, that we have. Uh, we're going to make assumptions based on that, that sort of meaning and that feedback. Um, and then we're going to draw conclusions, kind of like take action on, on, what we, on what we decide, right? And that's sort of like there's a feedback loop in this. So as we have more experiences that are similar, different, um, you uh, um, are going to like be quicker and quicker when you uh, like identify or, uh, or are for faced with some of those, um, those situations, right? So when, when we talk about the ladder of inference in our diversity inclusion model in um, uh, a five-day onboarding program for new hires and an immersion in Vancity's culture for existing employees, we often talk about sort of like how the ladder of inference works when people walk into a branch or how the ladder of inference might work when people call into our, our call center, right? And what are the kind of split-second decisions, what are the biases that come to bear in people's mind, whether they're a, a, a financial services representative or a teller, a branch manager, and what, the, what actions being taken um, might have positive or, or perhaps not so positive consequences, and what are ways we can sort of like put in different kinds of decisions or thinking to mitigate bias as we go up and down our ladder of inference. How this happened on, uh, in a team meeting um, uh, that I was leading a few weeks ago was we were talking about um, some of the, the nature of our, our youth internship program or our community leader internship program um, and focusing on uh, providing employment for people who face barriers to employment. And one of the people on our team said, but the interns we've had have all been awesome. Like they don't have barriers to employment, right? So you can see going kind of like up and down the ladder right there. Um, there uh, was a, an acknowledgement that like, the output of work um, is the only def like, defining quality of someone who is working in an organization, right? Not really acknowledging what might be going on in their, in their head, um, why someone had to change their schedule to work from home because they have an anxiety disorder, which is a thing that happened, um, or other kinds of like, invisible disabilities or invisible challenges people might, might face, right? That could make um, uh, their um, uh, pursuit of employment uh, difficult. Right? So that was an example where we got to talk about the ladder of inference, and it was um, pretty funny because it was a person who um, teaches this stuff to, to new hires, so uh, and was like very receptive to getting some uh, uh, critical feedback about, uh, about that concept. 
these are very um, specific ways biases manifest, right? So um, there's a, a, it's likely that you are going to favor people that kind of like look and speak and talk and behave in ways you do. Uh, you're probably gonna, uh, people favor decisions that are safer, like, the, like less risky. That could be about like trying a new thing at, at work. It could be um, public speaking, um, things like that. Like you could, things that are safer um, so, and com more comfortable is usually the route humans take. And then as I take you back to, the savanna and thinking, thinking of like how our brains are still kind of like hardwired to run away from tigers and saber tooth tigers and elephants and mammoths and things like that. It's like, it starts to make a bit more sense that we favor safety and comfort over risk and innovation often. Um, we uh, um, we uh, struggle to like think about things that are far away as opposed to what's like right in, right in front of us. And I gotta say like, I, I um, as a fast talker, a natural activator, natural activator, um, when I was going through this, this learning experience myself, I thought that the thing that I needed to work on the most was my um, bias for speed, right? To get things done quickly, start things, move things forward. Um, and when I was asking for feedback from my team and my colleagues, they all said like, sure, but that's one you like, you know about and you've been trying to sort of like mitigate that bias over time. What you suck at the most is like, you, you don't, um, uh, you put so much focus on the people that are right in front of you. Like you literally get out of your office, walk out the door, look at the people that are here, and then like work through a concept and probably assign work there. So anyone who's working from home, working from a branch, um, away at a meeting, is just like left out of this. And unless they're given specific instruction, isn't sort of like brought along this piece of work. Um, and it's and so things like emerge kind of out of context. So like that's the thing you probably need to work on the most, right? So um, it's an example of just this like favoring things that are, that are closer. Um, so, and I'll talk about some tactics in a second. Um, and then, uh, the, this is like one of the greatest challenges of humanity. You don't need to solve this today. Um, uh, we can't, but you should probably think about it, is the, whether it's uh, online communities or um, your social networks, um, really think about like how many people in your circle of friends, your Facebook friends, um, who you follow, the content you consume uh, online or, or in print, um, disrupts your worldview, right? Um, or how many people are like actively kind of like calling out your, your uh, perspectives and, and views? Like this is a, a thing about bias is we tend to like really gravitate to an in-group and people that see the world and think the same way, that, same way that we do, okay? So let's talk about hurricanes. So one of the really cool like nuggets for all the data heads out there um, that the Neural Leadership Institute left us with is they're kind of like talking about how to, you know, bring this up in compelling ways. Did you know that one of the reasons that there was more devastation and tragedy after hurricanes with female names is related to unconscious bias? Why aren't people prepared when they hear Katrina, Irma, Sandy, but they get more prepared with Juan, George, Ivan? So this is like, this is um, like decades of research around like, uh, this outcome. So like people from the, the weather network, FEMA, disaster relief, have found that there is, it is uh, unequivocal that after female named hurricanes, there's more destruction. And the theory is that people, um, because they're biased to like women and the strength of women and the, the devastation that a female named hurricane will leave, um, do not prepare as much as they do when they hear a male named hurricane. Right? Um, so I was all in when I heard that as a part of their, their pitch. It's like, that is interesting stuff. Um, and this, I bring this up because it's like, this is deep. This is like, goes to the very fiber of like how we think, how we imagine uh, ourselves and others. Um, and, uh, and I encourage you to like read more about it. Um, so let's uh, take a break from me chatting and let's plant some seeds of understanding our bias. So we've all like taken some time to think about that. And let's talk about what to do next. So um, I'll share a couple of examples of just like um, what I've taken into my practice and what sort of like uh, um, things that we're doing on these like kind of micro levels and somewhat team levels, but uh, to sustain this at Van City. So when I'm faced with a decision, um, one of the ways I can do to, to uh, one of the things I can do to mitigate my bias is to imagine someone else's perspective. Right? So I'm not going to be able to always verbalize um, a problem or an idea uh, to a group of people to test it against different kinds of perspectives. Um, uh, but uh, there's a chance that I can um, 
uh, like imagine some of that in my head. So I have this, this friend of mine, we worked together at uh, UBC uh, when I worked there, his name's Darren. Um, and uh, he has like, is very values aligned with me, but he's way more ruthless. And so the, the knock on me is like, when I have to make people decisions, I'm a pretty nice guy and I, I tend to be like a, a, a bit um, uh, overly flexible. That's some feedback I've gotten. Um, not from the team I manage, surprisingly. Um, the, uh, so when I, when I imagine a people decision, I often will take his perspective and ask like, what will, what will Darren do in this, in this situation? And really listen to that voice in my head about, like, about his perspective and what he would do differently, and then apply that to my, to my decision. That's one example. And it doesn't need to be a, a friend you know that helps, but so think of someone who has, operates a bit differently than you. That's one way. Um, another is to imagine just like, and it's a pretty fun exercise, it's like what would a famous person do? Right? Don't pick Hitler. Um, but like, what would, a, what would a, a famous person do or a celebrity do? Someone who like, you might not know exactly how they think, but there's sort, sort of this like image or this idea about them and how would they make a decision, okay? That's one example. Um, another thing we've done is a, on a, a, just a recent hire for our team, we hired a, a new employee a couple months ago, um, was to actively like surround myself with people who saw the, see the world differently than I do. So it was a great opportunity to, because he was gonna be working very closely with this person we were hiring, so there's a reason there. And also just like naturally sees the world very differently than, than I do and the, other, and the other person we brought on too is um, uh, we frustrate each other because she slows me down and I make her uncomfortable because I go so quickly. So it seemed like a pretty good combination of different perspectives to like really get to the, the truth of the matter, so to speak. So understanding, um, understanding what the biases are and then how they're going to uh, inform the interactions with your team or decisions you're making, for sure. Um, one time in a job long ago, before I had unconscious bias training and really thought deeply about this, I may or may not have hired a man named John who was an extrovert. Um, it, it went okay, uh, but um, uh, I think I would have done things differently knowing what I know now. Um, and then a, a thing that's been helpful for me, advice I got from a mentor a while ago, is like just the phrase, you know, there's something going on, I can't totally put my finger out on it, but I want to talk to you about it. And I want to help like work with you to kind of explore what's going on. Because that's like pretty safe language. It, it identifies that you're not coming in with, with judgment, you're coming in with curiosity. And then hopefully together the, uh, an outcome can be reached. Um, I want to, I'll wrap up with one last tip about uh, um, sort of like uh, mitigating the bias of like the thing for the thing that's right in front of you. Because uh, as you know, this is one that I said I have to work on a lot. When you're on conference calls, super simple. Include the person or the people on the phone first. Do it every time. And then it becomes habits like write a note, make it a practice. Uh, but it's like it goes a long way for them. It also, if they're trying to coast through a meeting because they're on the phone and they think no one's going to pay attention to them, it wakes them up pretty quickly. Um, and it ch changes their behavior as well and their expectations. But that's just a simple thing um, to do. So uh, this is what we set out to achieve. Okay. We were looking at like some of these things we were pursuing and investigating in terms of um, uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, um, looking at becoming a place where intercultural, intercultural understanding is the norm, access is the norm. And this idea of unconscious bias really underscores all of this kind of stuff. So you think about like what our perceptions are, how we think, how our brain is wired, and that's not good or bad, it's just the way it is. Um, and then what happens because of it was this, this kind of foundational piece that needed to happen before we could really move forward at scale with all this other stuff, like focusing on indigenous communities, um, uh, access to people that have neurodevelopmental disabilities or physical disabilities, um, uh, understanding like how to make a, a like a community culture, an organizational culture where everybody's a little bit uncomfortable because everybody's kind of more or less coming to the table on similar terms. So everyone should be kind of uncomfortable because any anyone who's like totally comfortable is going to be the dominant culture, the dominant decision maker, and that that means they're like kind of taking a bit from from others. So that's like, and to have that, we knew we knew we needed this like foundational piece, right? And then the choice of the Neuroleadership Institute, um, I'm gonna come down and high five you because you're being really patient. Um, the Neuroleadership Institute, is there a, a best in class um, for brain-friendly training? So it's like, I, I, as someone who's like done this a lot in a, in a few organizations, like there's a, there's a correlation between um, how the micro-learning of this, this particular kind of training like is connected to the results we got. Right? So we weren't asking people to take a 90 minute webinar and pound their face against the keyboard to get through um, to, to get the same outcome. We had like four minute videos and gave a lot of uh, power to everyone in the organization to like bring it up on their terms, how they, they saw fit in, in, their, in their work. Thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure to be here. Have a wonderful day.